The tempo of the development of consciousness through science and technology was too rapid and left the unconscious, which could no longer keep up with it, far behind, thereby forcing it into a defensive position which expresses itself in a universal will to destruction. The political and social isms of our day preach every conceivable ideal, but, under this mask, they pursue the goal of lowering the level of our culture by restricting or altogether inhibiting the possibilities of individual development. It remains to be seen whether this experience of degradation and slavery will once more raise a cry for greater spiritual freedom. This problem cannot be solved collectively because the masses are not changed unless the individual changes. At the same time, even the best looking solution cannot be forced upon him, since it is a good solution only when it is combined with a natural process of development. It is therefore a hopeless undertaking to stake everything on collective recipes and procedures. The bettering of a general ill begins with the individual, and then only when he makes himself and not others responsible. This short exposition by Jung summarizes well the essential importance of approaching the growth of oneself in a personal manner. The journey to complete self-mastery and actualization is a journey that must, above all, be taken alone. However, this journey is a great challenge for every individual, as it involves an encounter with one's greatest fears, challenges, and trials. The lifelong process of actualizing one's divine potential is rife with every manner of dragon and demon, in the psychological sense. Immense fear, anxiety and turbulence are the necessary tokens that must be reckoned with to realize oneself. However, today, the journey to self-actualization is often impeded by the illusion of personal growth through partaking in collective ideological practices, such as rallies, protests and gatherings. However, these practices exist thoroughly in an inferior level of consciousness and do little to penetrate the deeper layers of the psyche and so fail to create lasting and profound psychological change. The essential difference between authentic individual transformation and the false equivalent sensed in a group is described well by Jung in his book, The Archetypes and the Collective Unconscious, during his discourse on the psychology of group identification. To experience transformation in a group and to experience it in oneself are two totally different things. If any considerable group of persons are united and identified with one another by a particular frame of mind, the resultant transformation experience bears only a very remote resemblance to the experience of individual transformation. A group experience takes place on a lower level of consciousness than the experience of an individual. This is due to the fact that, when many people gather together to share one common emotion, the total psyche emerging from the group is below the level of the individual psyche. If it is a very large group, the collective psyche will be more like the psyche of an animal, which is the reason why the ethical attitude of large organizations is always doubtful. The psychology of a large crowd inevitably sinks to the level of mob psychology. If, therefore, I have a so-called collective experience as a member of a group, it takes place on a lower level of consciousness than if I had the experience by myself alone. That is why this group experience is very much more frequent than an individual experience of transformation. It is also much easier to achieve, because the presence of so many people together exerts great suggestive force. The individual in a crowd easily becomes the victim of his own suggestibility. It is only necessary for something to happen, for instance, a proposal backed by the whole crowd, and we are all too for it, even if the proposal is immoral. In the crowd, no one feels responsibility, but also no fear. As such, the convenience, safety and illusory nature of collective ideological practice makes for a very appealing thing to the man of the herd, whom shrinks from fear, challenge and danger. Often it is in fact collective practices and ideologies that impede, not assist, the development of the self. 
This is because such practices thrust the individual into a sense of being morally elevated, where there is, in reality, little to no fundamental psychological change taking place. As such, collectivized practices of ideology and morality are all too often tantamount to a narcotic or opiate drug, which effortlessly and quickly extracts the man from his state of destitute soullessness and wraps him in the temporary illusion of contentedness and peace. However, just as a narcotic or opioid wears off and returns the man to his sober state, so the energy and life of a group experience quickly dissipates once it is finished. And herein lies the essential addictive and destructive element. Through such practice, the pathetic herd man of a pitiable heart and soul may find distraction from the immense guilt of running from his divine destiny through attending such group practice. As such, for a man with a crumbling psyche that is falling into disrepair, a human rights rally or political ideology can provide an addictive illusion of purpose, connection and meaning. Jung summarizes this particularly well in the same book. Thus, identification with the group is a simple and easy path to follow. But the group experience goes no deeper than the level of one's own mind in that state. It does work a change in you, but the change does not last. On the contrary, you must have continual recourse to mass intoxication in order to consolidate the experience and your belief in it. But as soon as you are removed from the crowd, you are a different person again and unable to reproduce the previous state of mind. The mass is swayed by participation in mystique, which is nothing other than an unconscious identity. Supposing, for example, you go to the theatre, glance meets glance, everybody observes everybody else, so that all those who are present are caught up in an invisible web of mutual unconscious relationship. If this condition increases, one literally feels borne along by the universal wave of identity with others. It may be a pleasant feeling, one sheep among ten thousand. Again, if I feel that this crowd is a great and wonderful unity, I am a hero, exalted along with the group. When I am myself again, I discover that I am Mr. So-and-so, and that I live at such and such a street on the third floor. I also find that the whole affair was really most delightful, and I hope it will take place again tomorrow so that I may once more feel myself to be a whole nation, which is much better than being just plain Mr. X. Since this is such an easy and convenient way of raising one's personality to a more exalted rank, mankind has always formed groups which made collective experiences of transformation, often of an ecstatic nature, possible. Naturally, however, this practice of forgetting oneself in the fervor of group ideology arrives at a disastrous consequence. While one habitually enjoys the sensation of moral elevation that comes with such practices, his true self falls further and further into a state of decay, which of course only deepens his dependence on such group practices. This vicious cycle is the reason why individuals of compromised spirit and mind are so often found to be partaking in group practices. To the man of weak spirit, the group allows him to forget himself and become instead the avatar of the righteous morals that are brazenly expressed by the whole group. However, this dangerous and intoxicating element of group practice does not mean that all group practices necessarily promote psychological illness. With the correct structure, a group practice may in fact be a highly effective means to create true individual transformation and growth. Namely, the tendency of group subconscious forces to cast a spell, so to speak, is counteracted so long as there is an essential focus on the individual. In other words, group experiences can enact permanent positive growth as long as the focus of the group practice is centered on the individual experience not on some collective ideal. As Jung puts it, This special psychological situation must not be confused with participation in a transformation rite, which, though performed before an audience, does not in any way depend upon group identity or necessarily give rise to it. To experience transformation in a group and to experience it in oneself are two totally different things.
The inevitable psychological regression within the group is partially counteracted by ritual, that is to say, through a cult ceremony which makes the solemn performance of sacred events the center of group activity and prevents the crowd from relapsing into unconscious instinctuality. By engaging the individual's interest and attention, the ritual makes it possible for him to have a comparatively individual experience even within the group, and so to remain more or less conscious. But if there is no relation to a center which expresses the unconscious through its symbolism, the mass psyche inevitably becomes the hypnotic focus of fascination, drawing everyone under its spell. That is why masses are always breeding grounds of psychic epidemics. Therefore, it is essential to greet group practice and ideology with a due amount of caution, and to always regard its members with a certain degree of skepticism. One must never forget that he is in of himself a being of subconscious nature first, and consciousness second. That is why it is necessary to be on guard against the habitual expression of moralistic and political ideology in a group. If the group has no ritualistic and targeted approach to the individual as center, then they are left vulnerable to the most dangerous archetypal and shared subconscious forces, which naturally arise in uncontrolled group activity. By extension, this dangerous psychological tendency of group practice serves as an excellent reminder of a most valuable lesson, that the journey to self-mastery and individuation is a journey that must, above all, be taken alone. As Nietzsche writes in his book, Untimely Meditations, No one can construct for you the bridge upon which precisely you must cross the stream of life no one but you yourself alone. There are, to be sure, countless demigods which would bear you through the stream, but only at the cost of yourself. You would put yourself in pawn and lose yourself. There exists in the world a single path along which no one can go except you. Whither does it lead? Do not ask, go along it. While one may find every kind of distraction imaginable from this undying truth, the nature of the psyche and spirit will always humble the one who pretends he is something greater than he is. Only you and you alone hold the keys to unlock who you really are. Only you may step forth into the gaping ravine of your psyche and reckon with the demons and dragons that lie in wait to consume you. Only you may find your sword and shield and attain true mastery of self and being. Ultimately, everything external to the journey within is little more than a distraction. The one that understands this truth and holds it close to his heart will encounter the greatest of challenges and the mightiest of demons. But therein lies the gold, and therein may very well lie the meaning of life. <laughs>